This conference will now be recorded. Hey everyone, thanks so much for joining us today. I'm Jody Collado with Wellspring Solutions, and we're so pleased to be partnering with Dr. Cheryl Greenberg today as we talk about the importance of social connection and you know doing that with a creative touch. But before we begin, I just want to share some information with you about our services at Wellspring Solutions and how we might help you or someone you know in the community. So first we offer a free and confidential memory screening. We are licensed to offer the Memory Fitness Series out of UCLA. We're certified to offer Dementia Dialogues out of USC. And we have our Memory Care Center and Connections, a Memory Club, which are programs that allow for our members to socialize and engage in meaningful activity, um, to express themselves creatively with art and with music and with movement. And we offer lunch. Um, at the Memory Care Center, we have a nurse with helping with healthcare monitoring as well as staff to assist with personal needs and connections and memory club is just a more abbreviated version offering the social interaction but no hands-on care we also offer caregiver education our virtual programming right now offers um, classes on a variety of different topics and we also offer a virtual support group so caregivers can still feel connected and share their stories and learn about resources and feel supported uh, we also offer uh, home care services in Guilford County and if you're just not sure how to um, go about meeting your needs and what you really need help with please give our navigator Nicole a phone call she can help with a free assessment to come into the home or talk with you about what service just might best meet your needs whether they're with Wellspring Solutions or with a community partner so please go ahead and just give us a call or visit us on the web if uh, you have any questions and now um, it's my pleasure to share some information um, about Dr. Cheryl Greenberg. And Dr. Cheryl Greenberg is a life coach for seniors and their families who are in transition. With her guidance, clients who are dealing with health issues and dementias develop understandings about physical and cognitive changes, how to be effective caregivers, and ways to navigate the feelings that arise with these illnesses. Clients who are planning new, active futures find it helpful to talk about them and plan with her as well. Cheryl has a doctorate in educational gerontology and memory changes in older adults. She's worked and taught at senior living communities and educational programs um, at the UNC School of Education. So now I am going to go ahead and turn the presentation over to Dr. Greenberg. And thanks so much. It's great to um, have you here this morning. Hello, thank you, Jody. I'm really excited to be here today uh, to talk about something that I think is incredibly important. As Jody mentioned, uh, a lot of my work is with folks who are planning exciting new futures or who are supporting others who have a dementia or other illness. But today, I'm finding that most of the people who have concerns want to talk about how to not be socially isolated how to stay in, con in contact with other people, even when they're making personal changes in their life or when there is a community health problem. So we'll talk a little bit about today about why socializing is important. And then I'll share with you a bunch of ideas that might be helpful for you as you try to think of new ways to stay connected, even if you are a bit more cautious about seeing people face to face. Let me ask you, just to get us started, how often have you been in touch with other folks in the last week or two? How does it feel when you have a really busy social calendar? I'm guessing that when you think about the busy social calendar, what you feel good you smile a little, and that's appropriate. It does feel good to be in touch with other people, but it also is important to be in touch with people. Why is that? 
Well, actually, what we know is that we, when we have an adequate amount of social contact, our stresses, our anxieties are reduced. People who are depressed report that they feel happier. Not only does our stress and anxiety reduce when we are in groups of people or with a good friend, but we have um, sort of a sense of what's called social capital. That's just a way of saying that we feel good when people listen to us, when they say what we offer to them is important, when they share their stories with us. It gives us a sense of being accepted in the community, a sense of well-being. Well, all of those things, reducing stress and anxiety and that sense of well-being, feel good and improve our mood. But did you know that actually when we have an adequate amount of social opportunities, when we are with other people a fair amount, we are physically healthier. People who have a good amount of social interaction are more fit. Well, they feel better about themselves, so they're more likely to exercise, eat well, sort of pay attention to the kinds of activities that improve their health. Actually, when we are socially active, our brain benefits. You know, we have conversations, we solve problems together, we share stories, we listen to new information. All of those things uh, challenge our brains and challenging or using our brains helps them be actually physically healthier and function better. Our memories, our problem solving skills, our processing information, all of those things are better as a result of socializing. And finally, when we socialize, we are actually physically healthier. We find that our blood pressure is lower, our cardiovascular system, our heart works better. We are more immune to illnesses. And interestingly enough, people who socialize a great deal on average live longer. Well, that all sounds very impressive and maybe just somebody's um, yeah, perspective. In fact, all of those elements have been studied by many researchers. There's a wonderful researcher named Susan Pinker, and I'd highly recommend that you uh, pull up her TED talk. What Susan Pinker became interested in was um, the communities across the world where we see pockets of um, people who live longer on average than people in other parts of the world. And Dr. Pinker wanted to know why that was. After all, she could figure it out. Maybe she could help other people stay healthier and live longer. So she went to a town in Italy, actually a village in Italy, called Villa Grande, and studied the folks who lived there. What Dr. Pinker expected was that she would find out that people ate a good Mediterranean diet, and so, that increased their lifespan. And what she found out was that they ate pretty well, but they had an extraordinary amount of unhealthy fat in their diet. She thought maybe it was the um, hair with smoking and drinking. The folks there smoked and had plenty of wine with their meals, as was the custom of the area. Well, she looked at lots and lots of other things. Uh, and what she actually found out was that the factor that had the greatest impact that separated the people in this village from people in other parts of the world was that they had an extraordinary amount of social interaction. What Dr. Pinker describes is a tight, what she calls village of three or more very, very close relationships. Relationships where um, people came to see the older adult on a regular basis, made sure the person was uh, eating well, listened to his or her stories, enjoyed some games together, even shared their own problems and took advice from the person. These are close, close relationships. In addition, the people in the community, in this very small, tight community, 
also visited. They were, uh, there were many, many people who had casual relationships with the older adults. They would stop by from time to time to celebrate a birthday or to bring something to eat. But what they had was caring relationships on a regular, regular basis. So let's stop for a minute, just a minute, and you might want to do this now or you might want to do this uh, after the presentation. But think about who's in your tight social circle. Who are those three to four people who make the tight village that Dr. Pinker talked about? For example, who is it who would call you whenever something good happened to them? Who would you call if you lost your car keys in the middle of a snowstorm in February? knowing that that person would put on their galoshes and tromp down to your house to help you find the key. What we're going to do next is talk about how to not just stay in close touch with those people in your tight circle, but increase the number of people in the larger village who come by once in a while, who you interact with once in a while, because you have common interests. So as I thought about ideas to share with you about how to increase your social activities, particularly in a time when you might not be getting out as much as you used to, it, this just began to grow and grow and grow. So what I'm going to do is, is suggest some ideas for you and ask you to jot down anything that sort of seems to appeal to you now so you can think about it later. I also think some of my ideals will trigger uh, ideas for you. Jot those down too, and we'll talk about how to put them into action a little bit later. In order to, to sort of organize the ideas, I put them into five large categories. Social groups, learning, teaching, working, and volunteering. What all of these categories and all the ideas in the categories have in common is something that I call um, the ABCs for new social activities or the alphabet for new social activities. Here's what I mean by that. We have to be, for social activity to really have a good effect on our sense of well-being, on our health, on how we remember and process information, for it to be really effective, we have to be active. We have to do something, share something, engage with the other person in an important way. Look, if you're sitting in your living room on a cold Sunday morning, with your feet up and two other people sitting in the room with you and you're watching TV, that might help you not feel lonely, but it's not really the kind of activity that increases your social uh, interaction and therefore increases your health. We wanna be doing something. And the second part of the alphabet is bonding. The B is for bonding. It's finding people with whom you share interests and energy people you like to be with, they ring your chime. Now the activities themselves fall into the C, D, E, and F categories. They may be creative, you might want to take a course or invent a woodworking project or create a new recipe. You might want to do a task. That's typical of when we work or we volunteer, we have something specific we're going to do. We might too want to explore our, and use our imagination. For example, you might want to travel around the city, the state, the country, maybe the world. And you want to follow your curiosity. Um, what is something that you've always thought about doing but haven't done yet? What's in your bucket list that you might check off? But of all these things in the alphabet, activity, doing something, and bonding, being really engaged with another person are the most important parts of healthy and creative socializing. So let's take a look at ideas. Um, have you ever heard of the Romeos? 
I love these groups. They're all over the country. They're small groups of people who call themselves retired old men eating out. They name themselves, so I'm not going to apologize for the name. And what these folks do is get together once a week to have a meal and to just share things that are important in their lives. They do it every week, so they have tight connections. And they might have hobbies together. They might share books. They might talk about sports. But they get together as a tight social group. Um, you may find that. Um, going to parks and recreation or senior resources of Guilford, if you're in the Greensboro area, is a good way to interact with other people. When we're meeting in real time, in real place, there are um, lunch meetings and conversations about uh, conversations about how to give care to folks in our families. They might be traveling together. But right now, since we are mostly in a virtual environment, people are continuing to socialize, doing some very interesting things. People are at Senior Resources of Guilford are doing Tai Chi and yoga together using the computer. And somehow, Greensboro Parks and Re Recreation has running groups and drumming groups online. I'm not sure how that works, but it'll be interesting to find out. Um, I know that there's a lot of question about whether we should get together with other people, and I am certainly not advocating it while we have questions about uh, COVID-19 or the flu season. But I do advocate that if you choose to get together in real time, in real place, that you do it very safely. One of my clients said she simply had to see a couple of her friends. So she went out and she bought eight foot tables. She put them in her yard and she invited people, two other people, to come to her backyard, sit at the ends of these tables, wearing a mask, and catch up. I also have a client who has been biking regularly with a group of men and women. They continue to bike they are being very careful to, they start to stay socially distanced, to wear masks, and follow the best recommendations for um, healthy face-to-face, -face, as it were, socializing. A special kind of social group or support group. These folks get together because they have a common issue or a common concern. There are many, many of these. The common concern may be mental health, grief, substance, substance abuse, many different things. Uh, but I'll tell you just about two as examples. One is something that I do as the age coach. Um, I have a group that became concerned that because of their own health issues or because of the community health concerns, they were becoming more isolated. So they wanted to do what we're doing today figure out new ways to stay connected with other people. They've been meeting once a week for about six months. And what they have done actually is form tight bonds among themselves. At the same time that they have created new activities with people outside the group. They've developed book groups, they have an intercultural exchange, where they talk about how to promote understandings among people. Um, one of the people has begun to tutor adults who are learning to read. Jody told you about Wellspring Solutions virtual support group for caregivers. Very important that people be able to come to a support group where they get new information, they share their feelings, and they feel the bonding and the support of other members in the group with whom they become friendly often. And there are many, many other opportunities like this. You could look for Tuesday Talks with Caregivers Connections and Senior Resource of Guilford. Um, there's a brand new program uh, in four locations called Adult Children 
of Aging Parents, ACAP. And you might look at that too for information and support. Now, a second broad category is education, learning. And there are all kinds of uh, opportunities, both face-to-face -face and virtually. Uh, for I listed a bunch of them here in the Greensboro area. Shepherd Center offers adventures and learning. I learned how to make cheese. And also, I learned a great deal about modern art. Both uh, these programs are in person when that's possible and virtual when that's necessary. Rhodes Scholar is a very old program. It's an international program where people travel to, ver to various locations all over the world and also take classes. Again, these are typically face-to-face, -face, but today you can go to Italy online and see what the uh, villages, towns, and cities look like at the same time you're learning how to cook. There's just no end, I found, to the ways and the opportunities for learning both in person and online. Check out libraries, um, art galleries, orchestras, cooking schools, even craft schools, all of them offer opportunities. However, if what you find is that you're given the opportunity to watch a video to learn, that's not satisfying the socializing part of the activity. So what I recommend you do is if there is not a class where you can actually interact with the teacher and with the other members of the class, which you can usually do on Zoom or go to meeting. If that's not how the class is set up, then I recommend you find a friend to take these classes to, at the same time, and then you can talk to each other and share what you liked and didn't like and learned. Of course, education is both learning and teaching. What are your special skills or interests or knowledge? And how can you share those? Well, there are only a few things you have to do. You have to decide what you want to teach. You have to set up a go-to-meeting class or a Zoom meeting. And then get the word out that you're going to do this. And you can teach folks to bake Thanksgiving pies, build a birdhouse, take care of animals, uh, understand Baroque art, practice English as a second language, Write a resume. You can share what you know. One category that I told you about was work and careers. And I want to be really sure to talk about this for just a moment. Because what we know is that historically, there is this myth that when people reach 65, they just want to stop working, put their feet up, and be passive. That's not an act, actually what we're finding at all. In fact, 40% of people who are 55 and older say they want to either continue in the job they have for a long time, or they want to find a new job. Maybe they want to go from um, a part full-time to a part-time job, or they want to go from a face-to-face -face job to a virtual job. But they, many, many people want to continue to work. And there are lots of websites that you could go to to um, explore what the jobs are that are available. Uh, SimplyHire.com, The Penny Hoarder, and ZipRecruiter are just examples of how to find those jobs. Remember that when you work, you not only are being active, the A in the alphabet uh, for new social activities, but you're also bonding. Typically, we get to know and socialize in the workplace with clients and with coworkers. They become some of the people in our social work circle. And finally, volunteering. I think of volunteering as being very much like working. We still are doing something. We still make contact with people who have similar interests to us. We don't get paid. A lot of people tell me they can't find volunteer activity. They don't know 
have to match their interests with what's needed in the community. So I suggest here that you look at something like volunteermatch.org, uh, or in the Greensboro area, you call the Volunteer Center. Both of them um, can match your interests with the needs in the community. Look, you can do very uh, simple, straightforward volunteer activities that connect you with other people. You can call folks who are having difficulties getting out of the house. Check on them, share with them, call them on a regular basis, send a postcard, maybe leave a gift at their door. But there are also uh, fundraising activities like United Way's handbag drive to end poverty. You can even be at home, call folks about contributing a pretty handbag and have it delivered to United Way where they will auction it off and donate the money to people in need. You can work in a garden in real time, just staying close enough to be able to talk to somebody that's far enough away to be safe. That might be something you'd want to do. And of course, always uh, the faith-based organizations in various communities have lots of other needs and ideas. So there's more, there's advocacy, there are book groups, family meetings, online games with friends, and on and on. So what do you do next? Well, I'm a big advocate of planning. Think about what you will do next. Will it fit into one of the groups that I mentioned? Use your imagination. What is something that you've thought about doing or you'd like to do? It seems like a great way to get to know new people. What's one action you might take to get started? Make a plan for socializing. Write it down if that helps you. Don't let there be stumbling blocks. Identify the kinds of things you need to do to get ready. For example, if you want to tutor a child who's uh, in the local school district, you might contact the local school district to have them help you make the connection with the child. And also get a hold of their textbook, be sure you know what it is you're going to be tutoring, what the child's supposed to be learning. In other words, prepare yourself. Share what you do. Once you get started, tell other people. First of all, when you share what you do, that encourages other people to be socially active. And also, I strongly believe that when you share what you do, you tend to do it longer. It makes it real for you. And finally, celebrate yourself. Feel how good it feels to be socially active, be doing things, to be making new friends, to be in touch with people. Enjoy yourself. If you have any questions or you'd like more information about these social activities, if you'd like a list maybe of the ideas that I've shared, feel free to contact me at theagecoach at gmail.com. My phone number is 336-202-5669. And uh, all of this information is on my website at theagecoach.net. I'm wishing you a happy, fulfilling social future. Thank you. Cheryl, uh, Dr. Greenberg, thank you so much for sharing your time with us today, your great resources, your ideas, and I think your inspiration, you know, for people to go ahead and make that plan uh, to engage and to socialize in different ways. Um, you offered many people um, different paths on how to do that. So hopefully, um, viewers, you will go ahead and make that plan. If you have questions for Dr. Greenberg, please go ahead, uh, email, visit the website, give her a phone call. If you have any questions about Wellspring Solutions, please stay in touch. And again, thanks so much for watching. Take care.